Um, today we are pleased to, I'm pleased to present um, uh, Governor Roy Romer, he's the, the former governor of Colorado for three terms. Um, he's also the former superintendent of the LA Unified School District where he made you know, substantial changes in kind of the capital construction as well as have other uh, curriculum and instruction reforms. Um, he is uh, currently working for the uh, Strong American Schools, a nonprofit. Uh, been advocating um, uh, some positions that I think we'll talk about today. Um, he's also uh, chairing, I think, chairing a committee or organization called Ed No Aid, whose goal was to promote education in the uh, our, uh, recently uh, passed presidential election. Um, and he has been an advocate for standards um, in education for many years. He's uh, uh, been quite involved in education uh, work, serving in the Education Commission of the States in 94 95, and the first chairman of the National Education Goals Panel. And so, then without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Governor Roman. Thank you. I've been um, screwing around with this button. Is it on? I think it is. I'm pleased to be here. And uh, we have, oh, about 40, 45 minutes that I'm going to chat and then uh, uh, have questions. The, um, let me summarize what I'm going to try to do, and uh, then we'll do it. Uh, one, first, let me give you a little bit more background on who I am. I, I, you saw a little bit of a blib, and I keep asking my staff why I don't get all my biography on there. Uh, I'm a rancher. I used to herd sheep. Uh, the, uh, I'm an air uh, uh, pilot. I, I fly. I used to train people to fly airplanes. Uh, I owned and operated a ski area with a partner for 10 years of my life as a sideline. I've done a lot of crazy things, but I've been in the legislature. I was state treasurer, who was governor, school superintendent of Los Angeles. As you can tell, I had trouble keeping a job. Uh, all through that, I had a, a very uh, serious uh, interest and commitment to education. Um, so today, uh, I may call upon some of those experiences like the Los Angeles uh, or even flying to illustrate some points. But I have experienced running a major urban school system. I did that for six and a half years. And I... Uh, learned a great deal. It was a tremendously learning experience. I did that after I left being governor. And um, I have, uh, having been governor 12 years, constantly think of education policy about how do you improve a particular school, but also how do you help a nation come to terms with its educational challenge. So what I want to do is very quickly I want to lay out just a description of the dimension of the problem. And then secondly, I want to turn to what are the elements of the solution? And I'm going to talk about two things. First, a package of standards, curriculum, and assessments. Second, quality teaching. And I just want to say up front, the most important thing of all is the quality of teaching. You know, we can talk about all kinds of other things of education, but it's the quality of teaching that really is going to make or break us. But the way we organize it radically affects the quality of teaching. The third, I'm going to look at it again as though you were in the East Room with the President of the United States. And you were having a serious conversation about what ought to unfold in the next weeks and months at the national level on educational policy. So that's what we're going to have fun with today. And uh, I really look forward to the dialogue with you. Uh, Adam is with me, and he's going to run the, the charts. And uh, first, I, I just want to describe the extent of the problem. Um, Wow, we, I don't know how you feel in Michigan, but in Colorado or in Los Angeles, everybody feels like they're doing pretty good. We're really doing very lousy. If you look at where we are compared to the rest of the world. This I find one of the more reliable 
benchmarks available, and that's the PISA test. It's an international test, 30 nations, and uh, this is really like the Olympics of 15-year-olds in math. And if you ran that Olympics, uh, we are 25th from the top. Now, that is embarrassing. It's not just bad, it's embarrassing. Let's do the next slide. Uh, and and I, I want to be sure that I'm not trying to push off on you false statistics. Uh, there's the TIMS test, which would give uh, a more modest description. We'd be about 15th in TIMS. But I find this one is a more applied uh, test. And uh, this in science, uh, we're 21st from the top. My memory is correct. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so what I'm just saying is that uh, I just run across this all the time in Colorado. How, how is your school? Oh, my school's pretty good, but I gotta tell you, the whole system is bad. The same way you think about your congressman, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I could describe the problem, which I think more accurately is the international comparison, but dropouts is another way to describe it. You know, 1.2 million in Detroit, a quarter. And if we're talking about the crucial issue of the United States, which is employment, economic health, uh, you know, that's critical, and there's the financial consequence. Uh, let's turn to the next slide. Uh, leave it on for a moment. This, this was, I was going to leave this one out. <laughs> but this is 15,000 school districts in the United States. And this is out of order in logical thought, but I, I wanted to come back to it later. If you are a nation competing about the other 30, every one of those 30 have a more holistic approach as a nation to educational policy. We have inherited this system. And let's come back and talk about that later. I want to stay on need, on, on, on the description of the problem. Uh, the, um, I'm looking for the next slide. This one, thank you. Um, again, so you'll follow my mind. I really stopped talking about the description of the problem. I'm trying to tell you about some of the structure and the way we view it. We have a national test, NAEP, and you'll see that we have a cutoff on the green line and only three uh, states among the 50 meet that cutoff, meet that definition. There's a basic definition of NAEP, uh, and you can see how many are there. But uh, what, uh, what I want you to look at is, and let's look at the next slide, is, and this is typical of most states, we make an estimate based upon our own scores, and that's in the purple, of how proficient we are. In Michigan, uh, this is uh, your percentage, and I'm trying to see the year. Do you know the year, Adam? 2006, and the orange is how NAEP rates you as proficient. You know, during the campaign, I went to Iowa and in Des Moines, I asked the Rotary Club, you know, how proficient are your eighth graders? And they said 65%. You know, NAEP would say they're 35% proficient. You compare them to Singapore, they're 25% proficient. In other words, when we have these state standards, and drag out a scoring against them with our state tests. Uh, we, we have our own set of rose-colored glasses as to how we look at them. And so one of the things that we desperately need is a honest x-ray of educational proficiency that all of us can say, yeah, that's it. When I go to doc and have my lung x-ray, I, I want them not to give me the Colorado standard of how a healthy lung is, <laughs> I want them to give me the best in the world. I really need to know my condition or else I can't change my behavior to cure my lung. This is so basic. We'll come back to that. Uh, I'm trying to get rid of the slides so we can really talk. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think we're done with them, right? Okay, now, what I, what I wanted to do was to quickly use that set of charts to describe the degree of the problem. And I've talked about it 
in, in the last year, I've been in charge uh, with others of trying to make education an issue in both presidential campaigns. We succeeded to some degree. Um, and uh, this was a part of the charge to really lay out uh, because the, the description of how serious it is, because a lot of America doesn't believe it. Uh, now, rather quickly, I want to turn from that to what do we do about it? Um, and there are a number of things, but one of them that I want to really emphasize this afternoon are we need to raise the expectation of this nation about what is proficient, and we need to change the belief of the nation that all children can reach that level. That's a fundamental thing. When I went to LA, uh, LA, Los Angeles, uh, again, it's the second largest district in the country, more students than there are in Colorado. They didn't believe that all children can learn. Haven't for years. You know, the process of education is a process of sorting those that can make it and those that can't. And I just go at it and I think the nation needs to go at it on the basis that all children can learn. All children can learn at a high level. Because that happens in most places in the world. It ought to happen here. And so um, I think that when we start talking about solutions, uh, we, we begin with our current legislation, which is called No Child Left Behind. And as you well know, it leads it to 50 states to set 50 different standards. And I think the next president, the new president, Barack Obama, uh, has a wonderful opportunity to say, uh, we need to have a common understanding of how good is good enough. And let's talk about how we get there. Um, I think you can very quickly, uh, and I, I've been on to this one for 20 years. I was chairman of the original goals panel uh, uh, way back when, uh, appointed by President Clinton. Or no, no, the first President Bush. Um, the, uh, how do we get there? One, we could legislate it. Um, we tried that 10 or so years ago on history, and it got defeated in the Senate about 99 to 1 because we didn't do the right groundwork. Legislation is one. Another way to go is to try to work with states and engage them collaboratively to develop a common set of standards. And I think that this president has an opportunity to choose that or a method in between. Uh, but ACHIEVE, and some of you undoubtedly are familiar with ACHIEVE, it's an organization that is bringing states together in the diploma project, and they have 40 states working on it now, to talk about the exit exam uh, for high schools being more rigorous, uh, being benchmarked against the world, and being uh, more authentic in terms of meeting the needs of America. Uh, but I think that I would just put one of the suggestions on the table that the President of the United States, I think, has the opportunity to call in 50 governors, 50 state school officers, right now, and say, we simply have got to find a way to be more competitive in the world. We've got to find a way to have a more common expectation throughout the country. This is a very mobile nation. And uh, we need to arrive at that fairly quickly. And the President, you know, could uh, turn to NAEP or some federal committee or organization and say, draft a set of standards and let's legislate it upon these states. I think a more effective way to go would be to turn to the 50 states and say, I know you're all working on this. I'm going to do an incentive package on many things. I want to put some of that incentive money on the table right now to help you do uh, a new experiment. And he would say to the states, I want 15 of you to agree within six months to come back with a common set of standards and have a way to benchmark them against the five or ten best nations in the world annually. You do that and you commit to aim for that and carry out that policy in your own state, including the appropriate uh, assessments related to it. You do that, I'll put this incentive package on the table. One, 
I'll pay for the design of your tests. Two, I'll pay for the administration of your tests. Three, I'll give you a package of incentives regarding the improving the quality of teaching. And he would say, this is all voluntary. You don't need to do that. I'm not forcing you to do it. But if you voluntarily agree to do this, here are incentives that are very, very useful to you. And he could say, I want to start with 15. More can join immediately or you can join later. I just got to do this on a voluntary, consensual way, but I'm going to put enough incentives on the table where it makes sense for you to do. Now, to make that policy effective, he's also at the same time got to say and it's a second layer for those that don't want to participate that doesn't leave them totally out of the action. But what I'm saying, in summary, is the following. Now is the time for the President of the United States to say, we have got to find a way to get a common set of standards in this nation. And, this is very important, a common set of assessments. Now, I want to stop and use some analogy. The most national standard I think we have is the AP courses. The AP are national. And they're a very good set of courses. They have a standard, they have a curriculum, and they have an assessment. Um, the two nonprofits, uh, ACT and College Board, SAT, they have a set of standards that they are developing and are behind their transitionary tests. We could turn to them and develop a national standard. So I want you to know that in the practical world, we already are using national criteria for standards that we have not got that accepted by states. Now, why I think this is so critical is that we just can't continue to let states kid themselves about <laughs> a standard that's false. Now, let me give you my experience in LA at this point. When I went to LA, I, Los Angeles, I knew I had to begin to reform that district by expecting higher standards, having curriculum that was really rigorous that got us there, assessments that gave us periodic diagnosis of each student, and had to improve the quality of teaching. That was the package. And so uh, we, in that district, went to the national testing companies and said, give us a diagnostic set of assessments in math, first grade to ninth grade, every 90 days. Paid millions for that. Did it alone as one district. That was what was done. If I could have paired with 15 states and done that together, I would have saved money, I would have had others to benchmark against, and it would have given me political support for the community I was working in. But you get the point, if you really want to do this job right now, there isn't, you can't call up the Montgomery Ward catalog on good packaging and order it off the shelf. What we need is a curriculum based set of standards, curriculum, and assessments that's coherent. And there can be more than one so that you don't have, uh, you know, anybody knocked out in the publishing industry. And the point about, back to the president, uh, what I'm interested in his leadership is the achieve organizations going the right way. But you ought to go talk to them. They're working on the senior, uh, the standards for graduation. And they need to back map those down to the fourth grade, third grade. I want, I want to stop and draw a simple diagram because uh, I found that sometimes you talk about standards, but if you can visualize it, I'm going to draw a series of steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Now, the um, before I talk about schools, I want to talk about training a pilot to fly an airplane. I used to own, own a company that trained pilots to fly. 
There are certain things you had to know and had to do. Whoops, I said 11 twice. And certain things you need, ha, need to know and be able to do fly an airplane. And you'd come and pay me several thousand dollars and I'd train you. And so, you know, step three is to land it. Man, we had some very good assessments. We would ride with you and see whether you could land the doggone plane. And if you bounced it off the runway and you're sitting alongside it, that's a test that has consequences. And so uh, what we would do with somebody who has a trajectory, we would immediately say, wow, we got to correct that one or else you're going to kill somebody and kill yourself before we take step four. There's a curriculum that's aligned. And let's say step seven is navigation. You can't navigate it, you're going to fly into a mountain. But you understand, it was an expectation of standards. You know what it is? It was a federal licensure. It was very, very tough. Two, we had to have a curriculum that took you through the steps to get to that standard. And we had to have quality of teaching to get there. But what was critical was the periodic assessments because it told us what you knew, what you didn't know, and helped us then train, the, the, use the next period of instruction in a better way. Now, let's go back to LA. I got a kid in the third grade working on fractions. And that, that kid is way below uh, class level. We, every 90 days, would assess that student. And the teacher would be five third grade classes in that building. Those five teachers would all sit down together, and they had 31 questions. Everybody missed question 17, you know? They used the, uh, the, the test, the diagnostic test, not only to help know where the student was, but it gave a reflection about how effective the teaching and the learning in the classroom. Now, that, I wanted to, by this illustration, simply say, that it isn't enough to talk about standards alone. You know, I, got a, I got a book of standards here. They're very technical. What you need to talk about is something that can help that fourth grade teacher every day of the curriculum year know whether or not I'm spending the right kind of time, whether I'm spending it effectively, whether I need help for this student or I need help for myself. So it's standards, curriculum, quality of teaching, and assessments. That's the package. Now, let's go back then to this map. You want to show it on the, on the thing again? Uh, how, do you, how do you, as uh, President of the United States, when you're looking at an economy, what's the unemployment rate in Michigan now, 11? Okay, you, you all understand how badly, I mean, this thing's biting the world is biting us really bad. And you're the President of the United States. You're sitting there with your staff, and you know you got to keep the nation safe, you know. You, 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 the next thing is you turn to the economy and say, how do we get it right? The first thing, you got to get the money flowing through the banks. But the key thing is having workers usefully employed producing something the world needs. And that takes skill. And we got 25 nations in the world who are better than we in math. So the president is sweating blood. He says, what am I going to do with that when I got a nation in which uh, uh, you're, the, you're on a school board? What's the size of your district? 1,368 students. He's one of 15,000 in the country. How do you then create public policy and education that begins to correct that. Now, Tony Blair, when he took over in England, one of the first things he aimed at was how do you change the educational policy of a nation? They have more tradition in all these other countries of acting nationally. We don't. We're states' rights. Not only states' rights, we're district rights. <laughs> and I, I think that now is the time that we need really wise federal leadership that doesn't trample on that tradition which we have, but helps lead it to a higher level of performance. And I think to summarize once again, I think the most effective thing the president can do 
is to help states collaboratively arrive in groups of common standards. And I say 15 ought to be a beginning. And, you, and I begin with, with math, science, and language arts, and leave history alone. We can fight about that later. Um, and um, I would couple it with some real federal research on the quality of assessments. And just before I leave it, I just want to tell you, this is what is so critical. When I started spending these millions to get diagnostic tests in California, I learned a whole lot about testing. You know, summative and, uh, what is the other word? Formative. Formative. Different kinds of questions. And, uh, but the, you can't expect an individual school teacher to do this alone. You can't expect a district to do this alone. This is highly scientific stuff. And you take Algebra II in high school, there aren't that many forms of doing Algebra II properly. You know, we could get to where we truly could assist ourselves with national standard, arrived at consensually, buttressed by good research on tests that give you assessments that's really, really a good one. And that is so critical because as I watch the assessments in my own district, people will teach to those because there's consequence in them. And so you've got to be sure you have the right tests. Back on the airplane analysis, it's all right to teach to the assessment if you, if, you, if you got the right assessment. Well, I wanted to lay that piece out. But then I want to return to the quality of teaching. Um, because even though my own work in the last few years has been most focused upon standards, uh, and, and I, I know you've got to begin there, but ultimately, it's the quality of teaching. When I came to LA, uh, well, one of you in the room, one of you in the room, I did an inquiry with uh, before uh, the, the, this conversation. And uh, the person had graduated in undergrad and uh, gone out to teach. And there were about 120 people out of that college that went to teach that year. And I asked him, how many of these teachers you'd like to have teach your own child? And his answer was 50%. And then he paused and said, no, that's too high. 30%? Now, I believe the 30. When I went to LA, and uh, I gotta be careful about this, but if I went to LA and said, how many of those teachers were competent in teaching in the elementary grades, teaching, not, not uh, I gotta state this right, were teaching competently in their present status of learning, I wouldn't have said more than 30% either. Now, what do you do when you got a system that is turning to everybody who graduates and with a teaching certificate, hiring them, giving them tenure, and keeping them for 40 years? You're just not going to get it done. Now, what are the best nations in the world doing? I'll use two, Korea and Singapore. In Korea, they have a restrictive admission into the teaching profession. Top 10% get into teaching in Korea. And elementary school is more restrictive than high school. You can't get into teaching in elementary school unless you have a master's. You can teach high school without it. Now, they've made some value judgments in their policy, but the key to it is it's restrictive admission. Let's talk about Singapore. Singapore also is restrictive, but when you are admitted to the School of Education, you're given a paycheck. You're on salary. And, and, you know, you, you are paid while you're in school. And you're guaranteed a lifetime job when you get out, provided you maintain the quality of learning. And what has happened to the culture of teaching? It is the highest in those countries. Teaching is rated above law in both of those uh, nations. So what, and, and um, I, I want to recommend a, a, a study to you. Uh, it's done by the McKinsey Group, uh, and it has a kind of a blank paper cover, but it's 
a summary. They looked at the world and about what it really needed, we needed to do worldwide to improve teaching. And they came down on three things. One, you got to improve the quality of people you bring into the profession. Two, you got to train them a whole lot better than we're doing now and have a continual training for them. And three, you have to have a system that insists that every youngster is in front of a quality teacher and is reaching for the highest uh, uh, learning performance uh, that is expected. And uh, the, uh, I think of this chart. It's just whenever you get a kid in any one of these classes that's below grade level or below expected level, you need a teacher that is quality enough to bring them back and has time, extra time, to do that. Well, I began in the last year to spend a whole lot more time thinking about the quality of teaching in addition to standards. And I'm fascinated because there are many pieces of evidence throughout the world that you can't get there unless you're more restrictive in the admission of who comes into the profession. Because we have this pattern of taking some ordinary performing people and giving them a license and giving them tenure and then you got it for 35 years. Now some, you can upgrade their performance uh, during the course of their employment. But again, there's a lot of evidence out there that the key issue about quality teaching is the quality of mind of the person who's doing it, regardless of experience. Now, I don't mean to demean the experience of knowing how, about child development and growth, but I, but I tell you, uh, acquiring uh, the skills that we want our youngsters to acquire it requires intellectual inquiry. And you need the most literate people you can in that pr profession. Now, what do we do about that? I don't have any easy transition from restrictive admission to the practices of this country. I've thought about the following options. Why don't we get the president to create some educational academies like the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy? Go create six of them. Just locate them throughout the country and screen people rigorously to get on them, pay them a, a, a maintenance while they're in there, and direct them to uh, exceptional employment as they get out. Uh, uh, that has flaws, but it's a way of trying to get something going to get that issue on the table. Now, uh, I've been talking about the admission of people. Let's talk about um, how do we, uh, again, if you can tell what I'm suggesting here, it's the quality of instruction is the most essential thing in terms of reforming our system. And how do you get improve it? You want to recruit better people, you want to train them better, but also you have to have a system of management that understands what good instruction is because if they don't, if the management the principal and others don't understand what good instruction is. You'll play hell getting it reinforced in the classroom. And so you've got a problem of administrators knowing what good teaching is. And we get a whole lot of administrators that aren't spending a lot of time in quality teaching tracks. So I wanted to lay that on the table. Again, to summarize, uh, my head is constantly thinking in terms of national policy, uh, what can you do to raise the standards, make them more uniform, get them applied to every student, and have curriculum which is aligned to those standards, and assessments which is a package. How do you get that created? Secondly, in terms of improving teaching, um, what kind of assistance can the federal government legitimately give? Now I want to move from there to higher education. This is an area I don't know. I don't know enough about this. I didn't ever serve in it. I didn't take educational courses. But I am very thoughtful about 
and again, I'm talking about the restrictive admission issue. Higher education, and when I was governor in my states, uh, in my state of Colorado, we had some institutions that turned out, churned out, churned out, I would say, a whole lot of teachers. And they were not the higher uh, end of the class. You know, they were in the lower third. And that's where most of our teachers come from, the lower third of those who uh, are, are tested in college. And I'm, I'm just interested in how do you, in higher education, measure the quality of your product? Um, I know when you get to the graduate level, you have a much more individualized way of doing that. But in the other undergraduate level, there's no exit exam. And um, there's the did you pass the course, get the grades that you needed for passage and graduation, you know, of the individual professors. Uh, but I'm, I'm just curious because if you're eventually going to uh, improve the quality of teaching throughout America, we need to have some thoughtful consideration of how do you ensure that there is quality coming out of an institution responsible for training teachers. Um, now I want to wrap it up and turn to questions. Um, the, uh, I am, um, it's very interesting. We have an interesting perspective on this. I was a governor for 12 years. I was a school superintendent for six and a half. I was chairman of the National Democratic Party for a couple of years. And um, I am uh, now, uh, at age 80, focusing upon uh, how do I bring my own mind to terms with what I ought to be advocating as a citizen or as whatever uh, to help cure this problem or improve this problem over a period of time. and. Uh, there are a lot of good-hearted people who are trying to do some very important things. One of them is to think about the charter group. Uh, I was always very supportive of charters when I was governor and uh, one of the first in the nation to do so. And I think that charters are very helpful because they try different things, but also it is a check against the public school system, an alternative to it. And there are some public school systems that are so poor performance, you need an alternative for them. But yet, charters are not tackling, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of isolated illustrations of good practice, but they're not tackling the main policy issues that we face as a nation. And um, I have thought about talking more publicly about can you get there from here working with 15,000 districts? Now, it's not just the districts, it's the way they're governed. I, I, I work for one in Los Angeles that had seven board members. And they were elected in the city of Los Angeles. It's a big area. And so you know money counts, right? In the election of school board members in an area. And who has the most money to put on the table? The unions. And I'm a Democrat, I'm pro-union. But I worked for a board that uh, during my labor negotiations, my board members, this happened, would come in and sit on the other side of the table. <laughs> that didn't happen once, that happened repeatedly. That, that, was, that was, you know, you, you take what you got and you work with it. But uh, I, I, won't, I don't want to lose the train of thought. I was trying to conclude my conversation with you by saying that I sit and I think about what it is we need to do. And the conclusion is, you gotta move, out, move on it at every level. If you're running a school district of 1,500 kids, you gotta do the very best job you can to make that an illustration of good practice. If you're in a state, you gotta do everything you can to be sure that state has uniform expectations that are high and policies that are implementing it. If you're thinking about it as a nation, we gotta be cutting edge. We got a very unusual opportunity now because somebody's gonna spend one hell of a lot of money 
in the immediate months ahead, <laughs> quote, to stimulate the economy. That is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to shape some of the spending of that money in a way in which we create economic activity, but in an area that, uh, let me just say, just researching for better tests or other methodology, an area that doesn't get that much attention. Thanks for letting me share all this with you. Love to have your comments or questions. Go ahead, sir. I'd be interested in who it is. Tell me who you are when you speak. Uh, I'm a professor here in the math department and also in the School of Ed. Good. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say things that I agree with you about and then question something else. Appreciate that. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the problem is national and that the idea that we have 50 different state standards is kind of crazy. I think. Uh, presented assessments as maybe driving the change. I think the next stage would really be curriculum, and that has something to do with improving teacher quality because some of the research shows that teachers uh, perform best when they're trained with the kind of curriculum they'll be using in their schools. And with dozens of different curricula, you can't design teacher education programs for that. But, uh, and I agree with you also that the central and the most difficult problem is really quality of teaching and teacher professional preparation. But um, the idea that you emphasize the recruitment problem of admitting mm -hmm. highly qualified people as if you have to have a certain kind of gift to be a competent teacher, I would juxtapose that with your rhetoric about expectations of high achievement for all students. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and remind you that teaching is the uh, largest profession in the country. There are 13.7 million teachers. So the idea that we're going to solve the problem by enlisting a highly qualified top demographic maybe is not something that could really scale up. On the other hand, there are professions like nursing with a similar de demographic where I think we do have competent programs of professional preparation. Uh, ordinary people can learn to teach well if, if they're taught and professionally prepared to do so. The teachers we have in the schools are the products of the system that we're trying to change. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to expect them to have the knowledge and the skills that we want them to achieve. So I think I would place more emphasis on the quality of teacher education programs and professional development and the general support that teachers are provided in their work. I appreciate the question. I, I want everybody in the room to know, I hope I showed appropriate humbleness about my understanding of this approach of being restrictive. I mean, I am reading about it, I'm looking at other nations, and I see how well Finland, Korea, Singapore do with being restrictive, but I don't know how to do it here. And so I don't, I'm not advocating that we do it. So that's the first point. Secondly, you did catch me, and that is if I expect all students to reach a high standard, why not teachers? Um, but the point I was trying to make is that, uh, and I maybe have a bias here, but I think the best teachers are the ones who are most intellectually curious. And I know they need to understand the development stages of a child. They need to understand a lot of psychology. But I think the best teachers are the ones who are intellectually curious, transmit that to students, and also have a rigor of the mind that can help us really sort out uh, truth and non-truth in, in history and other matters. I, um, but you're saying that's a, innate rather than something they can learn. No, I think you can learn that. It's not innate. But I think you need to learn that to be a good teacher. Uh, I agree. Good. 
What? They found no other substance and no high Yeah. Um, the, uh, I just think the rote business of taking kids through literature with, is over against really helping them dig deeply into the nuance of the writing is life or death, critical. And same in math. Uh, I've seen a lot of teachers go through the rote business of fractions in which kids don't understand proportionality at all. They just know how to do the formula. But I just think intellectually curious people are the ones you learn most from. Great. Yes. Uh, a fellow pilot, also former director of policy at our state school board uh, here and now at the School of Education. Um, as a fellow pilot, I'm going to chide you a little bit. Good. Say that I think you are fixating on one instrument. Because you're a policy guy, you're, you're looking at, um, at a national policy solution here instead of scanning um, as widely as you should. And I have that just critique of that. First um, is that when you put up those NAEP figures, these would be our Michigan figures, for yeah. example. Yeah. Michigan figures are about 71, 75% or so in terms of yeah. um, proficiency. Um, as a politician, the, what's the response if you tell 75% of the families out there that listen to the daily the, or are not proficient? We really end up with numbers at the state level because politically we can't sustain the backlash of saying that Ann Arbor Public Schools and, uh, is failing half of its kids. And that's what generates. We've changed in this state our standards, I think, four or five times in the last 15 years each time kind of weaken them, um, changing what the definitions are and whatnot. And I don't see there's any reason that a national assessment avoids that political Uh, I, uh, what? I'm going to give you a part two. Well, let me answer first one. Let me answer that. It's a good question. I'm a politician, and I was thinking as you asked the question, there have been times in my life that uh, I, uh, I couldn't handle the heat. And um, uh, let's talk about gay. You know, I, I'm a country guy. I didn't understand the issue of gayness. And I learned it, and I learned it really well. And um, I began to spend a lot of time with the community, and I got into the gay marriage issue, and, and I knew I was off base with my state, but I, uh, in that particular case, I, there was an initiative to curtail the expression of gay rights. And I, I as governor, led the opposition, lost it. And then it went to the Supreme Court, became a case, Evans v. Romer. You know, but I mean, I have been in that scene. But on the education thing, my answer specifically is the following. I think the nation is ready. First, I think a whole lot of people know it's that bad, and they want somebody to be honest with them. Secondly, I think that it is a matter of economic survival. I just, the flash, the image that came in my mind, I saw in some paper today, it was probably a Wall Street Journal, the, the container ships, uh, 22,000, no, 12,000 containers on one ship, all being built overseas and all being owned by overseas. And I read the article very, very carefully. The, the, the world's commerce are going to other folks. And so if I were still governor of Colorado, I would be very happy to sit down with them and say, I want your kid to have a good life. I want to tell you that when you get that kid out looking for a job at age 26, he's going to be 26th in line because that's where he is with math, you know, 25th. I think they're ready to believe that. And I think you could put out in Michigan and in Colorado our proficiency based upon what the 10 best nations in the world is, is 37%. Folks, don't cry. That's just what it is. It's the same thing of, I want to tell you the truth about the CAT scan on your brain. 
Let me tell you what it really is. And then you say, and here is what we're going to do about it. That's what I think people are hungering for. I got to tell you, I think this nation uh, politically, and the Obama election is a part of it, but I don't think it's all of it yet. I think this nation is going to demand more truth than they have in the past. Because, you see, they've been lied to about global warming. They now see the water rise. I really believe that there is a, there is a market for political candor and even audacity on it. That, that's my own view. But I'm not running for office right now. <laughs> What's your second one? Yeah. But when you come out with, uh, or when the state here in Michigan comes out with its new test um, on, you know, Jan in January, and there's three extra questions about weather, and our embedded curriculum, the local school district folks don't think covers enough weather, all of a sudden you get tossed out of the district. Right? No Child Left Behind has the same kind of impetus. What it introduces is chaos into a, into a system. Your school is in I didn't finish a part of my description. When I said the quid pro quo, 15 governors said, we will go for this higher standard. One of the things that the president needs to put on the table is an exception to leave no child behind timelines. You have to give the timeline to a new, state, a new timeline. Now, one of the really critical things is when you really expect a high level of performance for all students, and you've got a K-12 system, what do you do about the guy in the ninth grade? you know, in the eighth grade, who missed all that. You have to phase it in. Uh, why don't you flip on that chart on, on Los Angeles of ele elementary school? I had this problem in spades. This is, this is the period of time I was in Los Angeles. And uh, the blue is the state average kid in elementary. This was Los Angeles. We were so poor, you know, you couldn't help but get better. But over the period of time uh, of six years, uh, you'll see that the, our points of increase were about 270. The state's average was 130. And we had some very poor kids, 72% Hispanic, et cetera. Now, that we could prove that we could do. That was what that package did. But let me show you middle school. Let me show you middle school. That's middle school. You can see that we had a much slower rate of improvement. And you've got to bring a, a kid in math. You, you just can't throw him into algebra if he hadn't had the proper preparation. And so you have to build in those lower grades. This is one of the things I'm personally so frustrated with the standards movement nationally. Everybody's working on seniors. You know, do we have the right standard for graduating seniors? I'm worried about the standard for third and fourth grade math and first and second grade language arts because Here's where you lose them. You lose them down here. And, and uh, now let me show you high school. Uh, high school, there's an aberration. You know what happened here? Uh, the, uh, we were, you can't believe this. Uh, we were short 150,000 seats in Los Angeles when I arrived just to seat a kid in a, in a high school, in a, in a public school. 
And so we spent $19 billion. We passed four bond issues. And we're building 140 new schools. And so we opened a bunch of schools in that year. And we built them all in the poorest portions of the city. And so this chart was based upon the rate of each school. So it had an aberration. But you can see we have been increasing, but we haven't closed the gap at all. Now, what happened in terms of public policy? In LA, I made a mistake. I started at the bottom and worked really hard, but the dropout rate was near 40 to 50 percent. And uh, some political movements in LA picked that issue and began to bombard the district as a failure. The press picked it up, and it is viewed as a failure <laughs> when I left. Or not, not, not failure, but it was viewed as not as successful as other urban districts. And it was because, politically, I had invested in the basement going up, feeling that, you, and, and my investment is paying off because uh, if you go back to the elementary, uh, the, uh, we're just about, you can see that spike from 727 right there at the end. The, the changes that we made are still operative. And so that's just a little bit of statistical stuff. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Who creates this curriculum being? A national curriculum. Well, here, first, I haven't used the word national curriculum. I've used national, I've used standards that are uh, aligned nationally. And I've used tests, which, but I have tried to avoid the word national because um, I think that we need con consortiums of states. You gotta begin with 15 who say, we agree that this is a set of standards and we're going to benchmark them internationally. Other states can join that. But in the diversity of this country, I'd be very happy to have another group of 15 in math, if there's a math war out there, that says, no, we got a better way to do that. But at least to have a group, the minimum nucleus is 15, because there is real collaboration in that. And so you don't have one standard only, but I would hope that we could work toward that. But on curriculum, and I've been thinking hard about that. I think you have to have multiple cracks at curriculum. Uh, and think about what you do in AP. AP has a standard. Where is the standard in AP? It's really embedded in the test. You, you know, and that's why I package standards and testing together. But the curriculum will vary. You know, you'll have a, a preferred reading list or reference list, but teachers can add their own. I don't have that worked out either. But I think we, you see, I am worried about having a monolithic national standard uh, and, and, and curriculum. Because then you'll have the Texans and some others begin to debate uh, creationism. And uh, I just think you need to have alternate, alternate packages of curriculum. But the, the way you begin to benchmark is use a test like PISA. That will give you, quote, an international benchmark. So yes, there's confusion in how we do that. But I think that the way it's got to happen, given 15,000 districts, you've got to have some national impetus. And that's why this new president's got to create it. And there's the step of getting the governors together and creating out of that. Or he could turn to NAEP or some alternative and say, give us a national draft that's benchmarked against the world. And then again, maybe, I just think it's better to have states work with you because if they're going to have to implement it. But let me tell you, it's not just getting a state to agree. States don't have control of their own education. In Colorado, I got 185 districts. The Constitution says, knock it off, Governor. You haven't got anything to do with these districts in terms of curriculum. They are the ones who do it. So we got a lot of embedded uh, culture into the way we have organized schools in America. Yes, ma'am.
know, much is much broader goals of education. Things like civics, you know, and history and, and health issues. And that when we when we focus on on just a couple subjects and have standards in just kind of these these really these big three subject areas, not only is that problematic for um, for students and learning and, and actually trying to actually identify standards in general across you know the fifteen thousand districts, but I think it also has an impact on the quality of teaching. They, they are intertwined. Let me go back at your question. I think you start with math and language arts and science because I think there is a common core worldwide about what that is. And I think that you do not dictate a national curriculum on it, but you have common standards and assessments. And you can even have a set of test assessments that have 80% common core and then variation. Curriculum, I think you need to leave to alternate uh, approaches. Now when you get beyond the three basics and into history, civics, art, uh, music, uh, I think that uh, you, you've got to be very much more open about, uh, let's take art. I have a daughter who is an artist. Uh, I think that there are probably, way, I don't know this field, and there are ways that people can judge quality because they do that. But I think you got to be very open to the new forms of expression in art uh, and, 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 and in music. You've got to find some flexibility. Uh, but if you get it in the hardcore subjects, uh, I think that it will raise the real fundamental problem is that we are not expecting enough of our culture in the education of the young. We aim too low. Uh, part of it's television, and, and, and uh, the, the nation's going to hurt unless we raise that level. Yes? Wait, a little louder, what? Okay, look, the key to me, to, to me in that question is holding them. Look, if you set this system up, uh, I think for the federal government to help participate financially, there has to be certain levels of performance that they don't need to be so tightly defined that you hold a person rigid. I think the key that you want to do is to make it transparent. I think that the parents of America and the citizens of America will hold local and state officials responsible and accountable if they know the truth. But right now, they're not, it's not very easy for them to get hold of the truth. So I don't think the holding is um, that much of a barrier. Now, there is, um, you, you see, as a nation, we have something in stake in terms of quality of our armed services. Our national defense, we're all dependent upon it. And so we grant the federal government certain leeway to hold us accountable for having a quality military force. I think education is also a resource of the nation, and I think the nation has a responsibility not to let us fall as low as we are. But it also has a responsibility of working with other levels of government so that they have some partnership in how they work it out over time. Uh, but that's just a part of the pluralism of America in terms of levels of government, and I think that we've got to plow into it. To leave it the way it is now is it just, 
it doesn't make any sense to me to have a national agricultural policy, a nation, national coal policy, and not have more rational national policy about what is our expectation for education over a period of time, and are we getting there, and what are we going to do about it? Yes. I, I, I think I agree a lot with the importance of some consistency in standards and assessment um, and expectations, but I think it's clearly not sufficient. I mean, we have you know, lots of districts, and districts have consistent standards within themselves, and yet we have pockets of low achievement in districts. We've had that for a long time. Um, now you've talked about some of the you know, ways in which you would need other uh, pieces to kind of reach those higher standards. Um, but I was actually, I'm very curious about your personal experience, both as governor and in LA. I mean, what, I mean, what did you find is the kind of most successful strategies or the, and or the greatest challenges to running a district like Los Angeles or to kind of overseeing you know, at a very broad level, education in Colorado. Let me talk about Los Angeles. The greatest challenges in Los Angeles, first, was just to work out the politics of the city and the board and the mayor. That's a, uh, I'm a pretty practiced politician, but that took as much skill as I ever had to put on the table, it was just to work through the politics of a district board of seven and, and owned a television station, held two meetings a week, and used the television as a way to communicate to the public. I mean, one day, one board member had a room totally full of African Americans, and it was all about me being a racist, you know? That, that, that kind of thing. That's a little challenging. Uh, the, but that wasn't the major problem. The major problem in L.A. was um, to focus the district on the quality of instruction. They had lowered their expectations, you can see from the chart. Uh, so you had to make them believe, once again, that all children could learn and that they can learn at a high level. That was the greatest problem. The next greatest problem was to get at the pattern of teaching within the district. Now, I chose to do something that is not universally applicable to all districts. This was... Uh, 450 elementary schools. And you know some districts will disperse the authority, just leave it to the school, give them total, uh, you know, let them create it. You can't do that in LA. They didn't know how to do that. The average experience of the principals was two years. And so what we did, we said, we are all going to use one way of learning to read. And it was open court, phonetically based. And it was rigorous. It was very tough. We then said we're going to spend two and a half hours a day at it for every child in the elementary system. That's what brought our scores up in, in math. We, ra we, we rose more in math than we did in language arts. And I just cut out science for a couple of years. That was a tragic thing to do for kids. But we were so low that, that we had to learn to teach again. And, and 50 of the better schools, we gave them the... Uh, the, uh, they could opt out. They opted out. After three years, they came and back and opted in because they had seen the progress we had made. And, and, and that was a, tact a strategy and a tactic that just that district was so far down that it had to have that. But then we have a problem of moving toward better comprehension and open court as a challenge for that transition. And so we began to buttress it, but we didn't throw it away. And that's why I think somebody raised it earlier about quality of teaching is related to the curriculum. Uh, uh, that's my answer. Yeah. Mr. Potter here sort of presented data on the key types of outcomes, mostly talking about sort of achievement as measured by test scores, but also the math and, and some of the motivations around dropout. The solutions you sort of discussed are mostly around I think, the achievement and test scores and stuff. Well, well, in LA, in LA, 
I, I felt the greatest challenge I had was improving instruction. But I had, I had 65,000 gang members in my system. Uh, I mean, it was really a lot. And uh, uh, when we would build a new school, the most critical thing was to rearrange the patterns that kids would walk to school. We would have to go out and carve out corridors and try to space people along corridors because we were crossing gang lines. That's a problem, and that's a real problem. And you got to get to the atmosphere of safety, and uh, you got to get at the bullies. You have to get at a whole lot of other things to make a system work. But here in one school I created the principal. I chose a principal, put him in there because he was absolutely excellent in dealing with those human problems. He could lead, every gang member had his personal telephone. He was wonderful and all that, but he didn't have any sense of what good instruction was. I had to take him out. You, you follow? Uh, so you got to do both. L.A. is just a challenge. It was, it was fun. Never learned as much as I ever did in any other part of my life as I did by doing it this way. Yes? How did you describe all the teachers and all that to teach students and stuff like that? Well, first, we would, um, this curriculum, open court, is a very excellent curriculum. It really gets the job done. But it is by the book. I mean, uh, you could walk into any classroom, third grade, and they'd be doing the same thing the same hour. And we, we had to. We were so bad, we had to have that rigor. But it was tremendously rich curriculum. And we would train those teachers. We would pay them to come six days training before school would open on reading alone. And we'd do that year after year after year. We really worked at training teachers. Then, the most effective professional development was the diagnostic assessments. If you're a teacher of 25 kids in third grade, and you're looking at your students, and you have a record over time, and you sit down with other five teachers, and you're talking about each individual student, what are we going to do? I remember one of those young ladies, uh, it was a Hispanic young lady in the third grade, and she was very bright. She was doing excellent in five categories of the test, but bad in fluency. So we dug into her family, and there was no English spoken at all in the home. And so working with a teacher, we took her day and made it so that she had to converse, had to be fluent in English with colleagues. Let me tell you how far I carried this business. Uh, because we were building our, our Playing. It's a very big district, very run down. I had $25 million, I was going to change the furniture. And I'd seen all these classrooms of these chairs with the arm, you know, the single chair all in a line, you know. Well, that young lady got to talk, to, to be fluent because she was at a table conversing, working as a team. And so I, I, I ordered them not to buy any piece of furniture that could not be rearranged in a group. System-wide, and all kinds of flack. What in the hell are you doing? Well, it was crude, and I don't want to always manage that way, but I had to try to communicate that, and I'd learned enough about teaching then to know that um, you need flexibility in the classroom to move students around. And I, I like the, uh, the model uh, that I often got out of Asian schools of kids working in groups. One more quick question, if there is, or we can just end here. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Governor Romer. Thank you. Thank you.